All right, everybody. Welcome back. Welcome back. All right, a couple things. Um, let's talk a little bit about the schedule. So let me get the, the sign-in sheet passed around. So right now we have exam two scheduled for uh, April the 5th. Um, I'm probably going to push it back. And the reason why is I wanted to put sheer and I wanted to put serviceability on the exam, which serviceability is what we're talking about now. And uh, I don't think we're going to cover enough of it between now and April 5th. So I'm probably going to push it back. What I'm, what's that? I, I'm not sure, honestly. This is what I'm going to do. Uh, on Wednesday, I'm going to come in with a more, I guess, updated, detailed schedule so that you all know, know what's coming on for the next couple weeks uh, between now and the end of the semester. Plus, I want to make sure I'm not double dipping on uh, homeworks and steel design or uh, I will do my best to make sure I'm not giving exams at the same time in your other classes. I can't make any promises, but, I, but I'll do my best. Um, from what I understand, you all have soils and H&H &H exams coming up, so that, you know, that gives us a little bit of a reprieve. Sound good? So you all don't have a homework to do right now also, so uh, there's really not much uh, going on in the way of an assignment. I'm actually not going to be giving you all a homework on serviceability. I may give you one Wednesday, but it's probably going to be Monday. Um, we'll see. Um, the only other, uh, I guess, uh, uh, meaningful announcement is we're not going to have class on Friday because uh, uh, the ASC folks are going to be at the Virginia's conference at Old Dominion, so we're going to be gone. Um, let's see. And uh, how many of us in here are going? So we got, yeah, we got a few of us in here are going. So. Um, so yeah, we'll be down at uh, Old Dominion, so we won't be here. No. No. <laughs> spring break part two. My spring break consisted of welding. That's what my spring break consisted of. Didn't it? N no. No. Apparently, I, I, I said I'm not a great welder. I can weld. I'm just not a great welder. So, But I had a couple that, that came out pretty well, didn't I? So, all right. What's that? <laughs> all right, all right, all right. All right, let's, let's get back to business. All right, so it's been a while since we looked at a lot of this, so I'm just sort of getting everybody's brain back into the swing of things. It's been close to two weeks with spring break and all that. So, if you recall, we were talking, like we finished talking about shear and we were uh, introducing the concept of deflections and serviceability. And uh, one of the issues that we noticed when we were computing uh, moments and, and, and serviceability, when you look at the issue, is the fact that some of your moments are potentially larger than your cracking moment. So you're, you're going to have a moment diagram where some of the moments are larger than MCR, some aren't. Okay? So, from a uh, flexural stiffness standpoint, some of the beam's going to be cracked, some of it isn't. So what moment of inertia do you use when you compute your deflections? Do you use your gross moment of inertia? Do you use your crack moment of inertia? Or do you use somewhere in between? And the answer is you use somewhere in between, and you use this, I guess what I'll call a weighted average uh, between the two, and it's called an effective moment of inertia. It's kind of like a little bit of your gross moment of inertia a little bit of your cracked moment of inertia uh, to generate your what we call an effective moment of inertia. So it's a function of a couple things. Number one, your gross moment of inertia and your cracked moment of inertia, as well as your cracking moment and the applied moment. And serviceability and deflection assessment is not a, um, it's not a safety consideration. We're not, in this world where we're not looking at uh, you know, maximum moment capacity or maximum shear capacity where if we start violating these limits, the beam's going to fail. That's not what we're talking about with this. This is day-to-day -day performance, just usability of the structure. So because of that, no load factors. We apply no load factors uh, for, for deflections. Okay, that's a big mistake that I see students making a lot on exams and homeworks when it comes to serviceability is they want to apply load factors. No load factors. All right. <coughs> Sound good? Now, one of the tricky parts with deflections is if you want to compute just the deflection due to the live load, it's not so simple, okay? Because as you apply more load, more of the beam cracks, okay? Never in the, in the history of a beam does it see only its live load, 
it sees its dead load, and then it sees its dead load plus its live load. So if you want to compute live load deflection, you've got to get the dead load deflection, the dead load plus the live load deflection, and then subtract them. And again, the reason why you have to compute these separately is both of these are going to have different moments of inertia. Okay? Sound good? All right. Now we started to work uh, on this example. We had the instantaneous live load deflection uh, for the following beam. Remember we said the difference between instantaneous and long term is that over time concrete properties change. We haven't done long term deflections yet, uh, but we will. Um, so uh, right now th this is just sort of like a, a, a mix between the stuff we've already seen in this class and some basic structural analysis. So we have a 20 foot long beam, it's got one kip per foot in dead load, that one kip per foot includes the self weight of the beam. We have uh, 700 pounds per foot of live load uh, and 3 KSI normal weight concrete, we're going to treat the beam as uh, simply supported. Sound good? Alright, now we've done quite a bit, a bit of this example already, so let's see. Okay. All right, so we started off and we said, all right, we got, you know, like we've done a lot of our other problems, list all the, uh, the parameters and uh, what have you. We started calculating some of the things that don't change uh, from, from deflection to deflection. Things like our gross moment of inertia is always going to be 8,000 inches to the fourth. That's, that's not going to change. Our cracking moment, that's not going to change either. Remember, it's your modulus of rupture times your gross moment of inertia divided by y sub t. Remember, modulus of rupture, 7.5 square root of Fc prime. Square root of Fc prime, you put in PSI, you get out PSI. So, so just be consistent with your units. All right? Uh, let's see. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, our cracked and transformed moment of inertia, I think this was the one that really started to get the memory next jog and really bring it back. I mean, it seems like ages ago that we, we did this calc, right? Because um, we had to compute our modular ratio, remember ES over E sub C, and then turn that um, uh, lump of steel into an effective lump of concrete, compute where our neutral axis was, and then transform that to get 4,066.4 inches to the fourth. And I think at some point during this example, you're like, wait, didn't we already do this example? Like, yeah, I know. That the, the point is to get the memory banks jogged. Okay? So, sound good? I think, am, am I correct, this is where we stopped? Okay, this is where we stopped. Okay, good. Okay, so we have got, okay, well, let me go back to the formula so that everybody sees what I'm doing here. Here's the formula for an effective moment of inertia. So we've got our gross moment of inertia, and we've got our cracked moment of inertia. So remember, you know, we've got our gross moment of inertia times a pile of junk, and our cracked moment of inertia times a pile of junk. Inside of each of those is a cracking moment and this M sub A, an applied moment. Okay, so that's the only one we haven't dealt with yet. But once we've got that, we can, we can uh, handle this accordingly. All right, so let's start looking at our applied moments. Now, the way I'm going to handle that is I'm going to start off by just doing dead load deflections, then doing dead plus live. So let's start off with dead load deflections. In other words, delta sub d, okay? Now, uh, in order to compute our dead load deflection, we're going to need the moment due to the dead load. So if I have a simply supported beam with a uniformly distributed load, how do I compute the moment? You all should know that by now, right? There we go, there we go. All right, so, so I propose that our applied moment for just the dead load is W L squared over A, just the dead load. Notice I'm not factoring anything. No 1.2s, no factors. So one kip per foot times, uh, what's the length of the beam? 20 feet squared, 20 feet. Don't forget those units. So what do we got here? It's 
M, M sub A. Sorry. That's the applied moment for this instance. That, that's a good question. Right what do we got here? Uh, all right, 50 foot kips. Getting those cobwebs shaken loose. Now that's M sub A. What is our cracking moment? 27.39. All right, so this is one of those instances I was talking about earlier. See, here's the beam, right? Here's the load. So the moment, <laughs> the moment diagram, what does it look like? It looks something about like this, right? And this value is 50. <laughs> the B, okay, now, now remember, remember, if you, vi if you exceed the cracking moment, that doesn't mean that the beam fails, it just means that the steel is taken over. It does not explode. It does not explode. This is 27.39, maybe something like that. What I'm proposing is that about this much of the beam is cracked, the rest isn't. So the moment of inertia, let me be clear, okay, this, this is important to make sure that you're checking your math later. What's our, bless you, what's our gross moment of inertia? Now what's your crack moment of inertia? Okay, what I'm getting at is that when we calculate our moment of inertia, it's not going to be 8,000 or 4066. It's going to be somewhere in between. Okay? Yes, sir? Uh, about, yeah. Well, that's a good, I, I see what you're saying, but stirrups are there to resist shear. This is moment. So, I mean, they're just, they're just going to split that way. Yeah. I mean, the stirrups, yeah, they might prevent the crack going from maybe over here or over there, but they're not, they're not resisting that crack at all, though. You, you see what I mean? Because they're not, that's not what they're doing. They're there to resist those diagonal cracks in shear. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Okay, does everybody have this? Let's move on. My goodness. All right, all right, settle down, settle down. Settle down, settle down. Come on now. Guys. All right. So I propose that our effective moment of inertia is as follows. So what do we have? We've got... MCR over MA raised to the third times our gross moment of inertia. Guys. All right, plus um, one minus MCR over MA raised to the third times I of our cracked section. I'll, I'll do a little better on that one. Okay. So this is where our calculation is going to be somewhere in between either our gross moment of inertia or our crack moment of inertia. Okay? So help me out. Plug and chug. So what's M MCR? There we go. Divided by MA. Now, hold, hold on. One thing that is really important, when you compute a cracking moment, if you just plug and chug, your cracking moment comes out in inch pounds. So it's important to convert to foot kips so that it matches this. Doesn't really matter what each of these are as long as they're consistent units. So they could both be inch pounds or foot pounds or whatever, just as long as they're consistent. Times our gross moment of inertia of? Okay. 
27.39.50. That's cubed. We don't forget that. And then that is what? 40. There we go. So what do we get? You got 4713.03. Do I have a second on that value? You got you have your calculator? Get out your calculator. You, with not having the manual, you got to bring the calculator out. Yes, sir. Well, okay. Do you, do you all need me to hang out and stay here for a second? Okay. We're doing that next. That's what, that's what I'm saying. We do the dead load, then the dead load plus the live load, and we got to subtract them. Hold on, hold on, I, I can't hear him yet. Oh, did I not put it there? I, I said no. Point oh five. <laughs> so my, because I even made the point. Hey, if you noticed it. Hey, if you noticed it, then you're learning something. So maybe I'm not doing so bad. All right, all right, all right. Has everybody got this? Okay, now, let's see if you all remember this. How do you compute the mid-span deflection? If you have a heavily supported beam, uniformly distributed load, how do you compute the deflection? Okay, well, virtual work. Now, if you don't feel like doing virtual work, what's another way you can, what's another thing you can do? What's, let me see this. Maybe, maybe this. The deflection. All right. Now, what page are you on? What? Figure one. Oh, there's not numbers? Figure one. Does everybody, does everybody see that? Yep. Okay, all right. Let, let me be clear on something. This is really important, okay? This is really, all right, everybody, everybody, this is really important. These formulas are, do not take into account units, okay? So I think the easiest way to go about using them is to ensure that all of your input is of a consistent unit, okay? Now, now watch this. All right, so let's look at deflection, all right? So in order to compute the deflection, you need 5WL to the fourth divided by what, 384EI? Okay, so there's four quantities that we need. We need a W or a WA. We need an L. We need an E. And we need an I. Now our I is simple. We literally just did that. So that's I sub E. That's 4713.0 inches to the fourth. Sound good? Now, when we computed our cracked moment of inertia and our gross moment of inertia, we were treating the beam as if it was made of concrete. So our E value, bless you, we need a value for concrete. What is the modulus of elasticity of concrete? We already computed it. 31.22? Thirty-one twenty-two. It's three thousand one hundred twenty-two. Okay, thirty-one twenty-two ksi. Now, right here, look at this. Okay, our our moment of inertia is in inches to the fourth. Our e is in ksi, so the inches match, right? But this is in kips. Okay, so let's keep that in mind. So, how long is the beam? It's 20 feet. It's 240 inches. There you go. 
no, it wasn't wrong, but, but to keep the units consistent, I want to put 20 feet, 240 inches. Okay, now, the applied load. In this instance, since we're talking about dead load, what's the applied load? Well, if it's one kips per foot, how many kips per inch? It's one, one, no, no, one twelfth. No, well, think about it like this. Here's a foot, right? I've got a thousand pounds on that one foot. How much do I have on an inch? I've only got one, one twelfth of it, right? Make sense? This is, this is really important to make sure that all of our input is of a consistent unit. Now, you're telling me the deflection. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Okay, five times... One twelfth kips per inch times two forty inches raised to the fourth power divided by three eighty four times thirty one twenty two KSI times forty seven thirteen point zero inches to the fourth. Well, what do we got? Yes, it is. But you all are engineers. You're experts at using your calculator, right? What do you have? I have 0.245. 0.245? So I got seconds on that. Now what's the units? Inches. So think about what this is saying. This is saying under that dead load, the beam's deflecting, bless you, the beam's deflecting about a quarter of an inch, right? So that, that, that's a reasonable answer. I mean, you're talking about a beam. How deep was the original beam? So we're talking about a concrete beam that's you know, that deep and about that wide. So it's not going to deflect very much under that load, all right? Sound good? Okay, now this is the deflection under just the dead load. Then what do you do? You take that beam and you then apply live load. So what we now have to do is essentially do that calculation again with dead load plus live load. Okay, so I think the next time it'll be a lot more rote, I guess. So, so now let's do dead load plus live load. You don't have a notebook? You don't have notebook paper? Oh, so, so you, hold on, wait, 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 wait. So you bought a binder that would only fit the amount of handouts. <laughs> Here you, you were talking about the bridge. Don't make the bridge fit in the box, and you've got the binders that will only fit. The <laughs> Actually, I don't think it's doing. It's doing pretty good. So, all right, let's look at the dead load plus the live load. So, what is our applied load in this instance? Now, this is important. What's our dead load plus our live load going to be when we're computing the deflection due to both? What's the load? 1.7. It's not the 0 0.7. It's 1.7. So, so we'll say WD plus WL, which is 1.7 kips per foot. So now I think you're going to find that the calculation is pretty plug and chug. So the first thing we do is we compute MA 
which is WAL squared over 8. Times how long? 20 feet? And what do we get here? Huh? 85 foot kips? Okay. Now, CT credit, let's talk about this. Let's, see, let's use your powers of uh, prediction. And let me ask you a question. Without doing any math uh, or any calculations for I sub E, what do you think the I sub E value is going to be in comparison to this? Is it going to be larger or smaller? Now think, think, about, think about like this. Let, let me ask. Smaller. It's going to be smaller. Think about this. The moments got higher. So more of the beam cracks. And if more of the beam cracks, the beam gets weaker. Beam gets weaker, this should go down. Let's see what happens. So we compute I sub E. I didn't miss anything, right? I think that's, yeah. So this one, instead of having 27.39 over 50, it's over 85. Now hold on, don't forget to cube it. Plus, and then we have 1 minus 27.39 foot kips over 85 foot kips cubed times that. So what do we got here? This, this is a little bit of a longer calc, I know. Say, say it again. 4202.5. See, I, I got, yeah, I got 41. 4198.3. Like, that's, uh, uh, that's fine. Is that what you got? Did you get 4198? Now, th that was a good try. Two out of ten for effort. <laughs> all right. Um, do I have a second on that? Okay, all right. All right. Has everybody got this? So we've got our moment of inertia, we've got our moments, we're ready to start computing deflections. So can I move on to the next panel or do you need a second? All right, moving on. Uh, we're on 50 minutes. Okay, so our applied load is 1.7 kips per foot, but in inches, that's 1.7 over 12 kips per inch. Our length is 240 inches. Our E is 3122 KSI. And what did we get for IE? What was it? 4198? For the new load, that's a very important point. Make sure that you're using, make sure you're using the moment of inertia that corresponds to the load. Okay, that's important. So now, our, let's see, our deflection due to dead plus live load 
is 5w l to the fourth divided by 384 e c i e bless you which is 5 times 1.7 over 12 kips per inch times 240 inches 384 3122 ksi 41 ahead of myself 4198 inches to the fourth thank you Maybe point two, maybe point two. All right, we have a zero point four six seven. All right. So now that I have got the dead load deflection and I have got the deflection due to the dead load plus the live load. To get the live load deflection, just subtract. So, so this is 0 0.467. What was the other one? 0 0.245. So the deflection due to the live load is delta D plus L minus delta D now what do we got What's that? That's a good question. All right. Um, first off, though, let, let me ask this. Does anybody have any questions about how we got to this point? The, the math, the equations, all that. Anybody have any questions? Okay. So here's what we use this for. Okay. This value tells us how much deflection we can expect from that beam under given loading conditions. What we would then do is take that value and compare it against a limit. You know, how much deflection is allowed in an office building versus a school versus a factory versus what have you. And if that deflection is tolerable, good. If not, we have to make the beam larger in order to sustain those deflections. Yes, sir. That's a good question. The answer is more often than not, no. And the reason why is because we can account for dead load deflection or make up for it uh, in, in, in other instances. For instance, we can cast the beam with a little bit of camber, like we can almost cast it a little upward. Sometimes you'll have some, maybe some shims in the form or something like that. And when you set the beam down and it acts under its own self-weight, it was previously, it was already had a little bit of an upward curve to it. Dead load comes on, it sits flat. In other words, so our dead load deflection was about a quarter of an inch, right? So what I would do is I would cast this beam so it had a little bit of an upward curve of a quarter of an inch. It sets down a quarter of an inch, sets flat. We can account for the dead load deflection using those types of means. We can't really account for it with the live load because the live load is so variable. In other words, I have to be able to size a beam that can withstand that much deflection. This I can take care of through other means. Does that make sense? Okay, one word worried me in that sentence, failure, okay? This is not safety concern. This is not, that's not what this is. When you start thinking in terms of failure, you're going to start thinking, well, I need 1.2 dead and 1.6 live. That, no, no, this isn't failure, okay? So 
I want, I want that to be clear. Now, when you mean how close, well, I'd say it's as close as, as all the other limits that we've checked. You have a, uh, a, a deflection, you have a limit. If you've met it, you're good, and if you haven't, you haven't. I mean, if the limit was 0.222, that's fine. There's no factor of safety in this because this isn't a safety concern. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? Yeah, this is just seeing whether or not we've met the limit or not. Make sense? Everybody okay with that? that that's important. What time it is? Okay. Okay. So far, so good? Okay. All right. Now, immediate deflections are pretty simple. Long-term deflections, on the other hand, um, we have to take into account some other factors. So, so for instance, um, I've mentioned this before, but over time, concrete properties change. In other words, if I cast a concrete beam today, and let's say I test its, I tell you what, let's just do it. Let's say I poured two concrete cylinders. I tested one at 28 days, and I tested the other 10 years later. They're going to have different properties, guaranteed. Okay? Concrete is a material that's behavior just changes over time. Okay? So um, we have things like shrinkage and creep and humidity differences and temperature differences that change the properties of concrete over time. So the deflections that I compute today are going to be different than the deflections that I would compute 10 years from now. So those deflections that I just computed, you know, they're, they're, they're they're fine for immediate concerns. For long-term concerns, they're not. And we have to adjust those deflections uh, accordingly. Um, so that's point one. Point two, remember singly reinforced beams and doubly reinforced beams? Remember that? And remember how uh, the difference is that with doubly reinforced beams, we had a layer of steel, the top layer that was uh, resisting compression? Well, you go down to the lab and do some tests, you'll find that if you put compression steel in a beam, I mean, remember we mentioned that compression steel, like one of the reasons that we account for it is A, it's usually there anyways to tie together the rebar cage and to keep everything stable, so it, it's usually there, so we might as well account for it. That was one reason, but another reason is that adding compression steel will actually, it can actually have a benefit on your long-term deflection performance, so um, you're going to see some, some uh, values that show up uh, uh, here in a little bit. And, I think you'll see where that's coming from. So that's point one. <laughs> Another thing, um, we have to ask how much uh, live load uh, is sustained uh, over its design life. So, so for instance, um, what I mean by that is, um, let me see the best way of explaining this. So if, if I have, let's say, uh, an office building. So you know, if you have an office building, there's going to be people coming in and out of the building. Furniture is going to be get moving, you know, moved around. So the occupancy load, the live load, it's going to change quite a bit from day to day and from time to time, right? So, yeah, it might see various loads, but one of the questions is how much of that load is sustained from day one all the way through its design life? And you might say for an office building, well, it's not 100% of load. Maybe only 20% of the load is always there. Maybe, for instance, the file storage. Like that never changes. That's always staying there. So you might have only 20% of the load staying there. That's for an office building. For something like a storage warehouse, uh, maybe not. A storage warehouse, it really, really might see 100% of its design load all the time because there's always going to be inventory in there. Um, unfortunately, there's no hard and fast guide to this. It simply boils down to engineering judgment. Uh, if um, you aren't sure and you say, well, I'm not sure, I'm the engineer in charge, I'm just going to be conservative and assume I don't know that there's anything wrong with that. Um, if you know, you probably are going to be, uh, it's probably going to be beneficial to change it accordingly. But um, yeah, this just, this just boils down to judgment. Um, in order to compute long-term deflections, this is how this is going to work. All right? So we're going to take our immediate deflections and we're going to adjust them by this, uh, this factor, lambda. Now to compute lambda, we need two things. We need a time dependent factor, which we're going to look at here in a second, and we need rho prime. Rho prime is, remember rows, remember they were reinforcement ratios? 
Well, rho prime is the reinforcement ratio for the compression steel. Remember how in our notation, anytime that we had a prime, it usually related to something in compression, like AS prime or D prime. Y'all remember that? Well, rho prime is going to be the reinforcement ratio for the compression steel, the area divided by BD. Remember that? So <coughs> that having compression steel is actually going to improve our, uh, our long-term performance. All right, so let's take a couple of things. So rho, uh, if we don't have any compression steel at all, we just take that to be zero. That's pretty simple. Our time-dependent factor, that's just a lookup. So you know, if I have a, a load that is sustained on a reinforced concrete beam, the longer that load is there, the more your deflections are going to start to creep up. This is out of the ACI spec, but here's a table that'll make this a, a little easier for you. So if the load is only there for three months, you can take your time dependent factor to be one. But anything, if a load's going to be there anything over five years, you take your time dependent factor to be, that to be two. So, for instance, if I was designing beams in Drinko, okay, those beams have, are supporting book stacks, right? As far as I know, those book stacks haven't moved in the last five years, right? They're there, they haven't gone anywhere. So in that instance, I might use the time factor to be two, okay? Whereas in, in a classroom, I mean, is it really fair to say that load is, uh, you know, the classroom load is sustained over five years? I mean, I know sometimes you're in this room and it feels like a prison and you can't get out, but you're not in here for five years, right? You're in here for 50 minutes. <laughs> that is Xi. It's lowercase. Did I learn that lowercase? You're, the way I write it is pretty much a, a bunch of scribbles, so, so don't feel bad. <laughs> it's a scientific bunch of scribbles, though. There's a pattern to it. <laughs> okay, so if you, want, if you need to uh, find a value in between, you could just interpret the plot. If it's somewhere on, uh, in the table, just use the value in the table. They're, they're both the same thing. Sound good? Okay. So I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, make your life a little uh, complicated, but because of this, we have a, a number of different deflections that we can compute. We have dead loads. We have dead loads plus live loads. So to get the live load deflection, we've got to subtract the two. We also have our sustained live load deflection, how much of that load is sustained. So, um, that's where we have the dead plus sustained live load. By the way, let me ask you a question. Our time-dependent factor that we've been talking about, uh, you know, how much of that live load is sustained, is, is it relates to live load. What's our time-dependent factor for dead load going to be? The, the 5,000. Yeah. So, so just two. Uh, <laughs> this, this, is, this is asymptotic. This is asymptotic. It, it just caps off at two. It's like limit as x approaches infinity. Two. Uh, it, it, it's just two. In other words, your time dependent factor for dead loads is always two. So. You put two, I'll put 5,000. We'll see what happens. <laughs> I guarantee you, here's, what, here's what's going to happen. If you and I compete on a project, I'm going to get the bid every time. <laughs> but there's a spike after 27 years. You don't know that. But but don't you want? But hold on. But hold on. Don't you want to win the bids to the contracts? I mean, you you want to have those economical designs. I mean, I mean, what was it? What was it? I mean, mo money, please, right? <laughs> okay. I did say that that that, that most building uh, uh, projects, the owner doesn't really care if the beam's made out of steel or concrete or popsicle sticks. Like they really don't care. They just want a structure that will stand and uh, be safe. So there is something to that, I guess. All right. Okay, that, all right, that's a good question. All right, so the question was, how do you compute the sustained live load? It's, be, it's the same way that you compute live load. The only question is, how much of that live load are you going to consider sustained? Is it, 
Well, you multiply your load by the percentage, but then with every new load, you have a different moment of inertia and a different deflection. So it is a little repetitive. Um, this is a calc that works great with Excel. No, see, I'm not kidding. This is a great Excel calc if you've got a number of different you know, sustained effects. All right. So to compute your total deflection, you're going to need a dead load deflection, a live load deflection, and a sustained live load deflection. So everybody okay with that? To get the total deflection, we take our immediate live loads, we add our dead load deflection, but then it's got to be adjusted for duration, and in this case infinite duration because dead load's always there. And then we have our sustained live loads multiplied by its duration. It's not a very hard calc. Unfortunately, deflections are just a very long calc. They just, it's a lot of the same thing over and over again. We will explore how to compute deflections next time. The only thing I do want to discuss is deflection limits, and then I think we'll call it. So once we've computed the deflection, you ask the question, well, who cares? What do we do with that value? Well, we compare that against the specified limits, how much deflection is allowed. Well, it depends on what type of element we're talking about. For instance, if we're talking about a member that supports flat roofs, not supporting or attached to non-structural elements likely to be damaged, what do we consider? Well, we consider our immediate deflection, not the long term, just the immediate deflection, and the limit is L over 180. See, it's very common to see deflection limits that are L divided by a given value. In other words, the longer the beam, the more deflection you'll consider. So we had a 20-foot beam on that last problem, right? What's 20 foot divided by 180? Point one 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 what? No, but, but units. <laughs> nice. No, no, but what, what are the units? So multiply that by 12. Somebody? Okay, all right. So, so bear with me, okay? So what, what I'm saying is that that beam, so listen, if that beam was supporting a flat roof that's not attached to a structural element, we would allow about 1.3 inches of deflection, okay? Would that beam have been all right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, it would have been fine. If not, we would have had to change the design. The beam might have had to have gotten deeper or gotten wider. So, I mean, it just is what it is. Um, de depending, so listen, depending upon the type of element that you're looking at, that will tell us what our deflection limit is. Some of them are more stringent than others. So for instance, if we're talking a roof or floor that is supporting a structural element, you know, that becomes L over 240, or in some instances, uh, uh, elements that are likely to be damaged, it becomes L over 480. So the more stringent or the more demand or responsibility that given element has, the less we're going to allow in terms of deflections. Does that make sense? It just depends on what you're using it for. Um, and I, and I'd are, I will say this, I think deflections in here are actually a little harder than they are in steel design. In steel, it's usually just L over 360. Because with steel, we don't have the cracking issue to worry about. We don't have to do this dead load and then dead load plus live load and subtract. We just calculate it and then there you go. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it, yeah. But, 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 uh, but if you, you know, if you give your beam to the same. That, okay. Line, it. No, let me say this, all right. Let, I'll, I'll answer that by saying this. We don't care about dead loads for immediate deflections, but for long term deflections, we do. I mean, that issue that we're talking about, we're talking about that on day one. But over time, I can't help it. The beam's just going to sag. Now, you could account for that and on day one have the floor curved up a little bit, but I don't think the owner would like that on day one. So, so yeah. <coughs> Sound good? Okay. That is all we have got. So this is what we're going to do next time. Next time, we're going to take that beam that we just did and then we're going to expand upon it. We're going to say, what if only so much of that load was sustained? What's our limit? And then go from there. Sound good?
That's all I got. Uh, I need the sign-in sheet at some point, but you all have a great day. We'll see you on Wednesday.